Hello, everyone. Um, I'll give it a couple, a minute here to just get everyone loaded in. And we appreciate you uh, attending for today's Digital Lunch and Learn with Dr. Keller. So. Okay, um, hello and welcome to today's Digital Lunch and Learn with Dr. John Keller, MET 84. Um, my name is Sarah Von I and I'm the Interim Alumni Director here at CARA. And just some housekeeping things before we get started. Um, this event will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel after um, the presentation is done. Um, if you can use the chat function and make sure to switch it to all attendees, just so we can know who's here and just have a, just type in your class and major and just make sure it goes to everyone so we can see. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Keller. Hey, great. Thank you all for taking time today to, to join this Lunch and Learn seminar. I'm gonna talk about a, a center that we've been working on now for about a decade as it turns out. And, as the title of the slide shows, it's focused on security printing and anti-counterfeiting technology that, and we, we abbreviated that SPAC. Uh, and initially our partners were the University of South Dakota and South Dakota State. And I'll elaborate kind of how we got here in, in this center uh, focused in security printing and then where, where we're headed into the future. There we go. So how did how did we get here? And it, it you know a lot of these research areas uh, that we're involved with it, it it a lot of times it isn't by design necessarily. And in a decade ago we were working with chemists at the University of South Dakota, and in that time at that point we were working on a project focused on alternative energy and uh, a project specifically that was called luminescent solar concentrators. And the notion was that there were these uni unique nanoparticles that would upconvert light and that you could uh, generate uh, energy from the upconversion uh, of these particles. And in, in the uh, upper right image here, are some of these uh, nanoparticles that were synthesized by the University of South Dakota, Dr. Stanley May. And uh, our job in that project of the luminescent solar concentrator were to print the, the particles on a, a gold uh, coated surface to maximize the upconversion of the particles. And, and But just from a physics standpoint, up conversion takes, in this case, near infrared light, and the particles up convert them to uh, visible light, and get you get more energy out of that process. And so our job was to print the particles in, in no particular uh, pattern, just uh, across a, a, a substrate. Well, the graduate student at the time uh, took their particles, printed the them as requested, but then also printed that version uh, that you see here from uh, US currency. And, and we had very good digital printing capabilities in the laboratory uh, that were, uh, that had come through an army research lab grant uh, where we were printing uh, conformable antennas. But he took it upon himself to print uh, a digital image and that was uh, what we say covert. It, and by that, I mean, if you look at the paper in the visible with no illumination, you see nothing. But if you illuminate it with near infrared radiation, they up convert and you get the visible image. And actually the, the, the image that 
got us really <laughs> excited was this quick response code. And at the time when the student showed me the quick response code, I said, what's a, what's a quick response code? Because a decade ago, so-called QR codes weren't that popular in the US, uh, much more popular in Asia. Uh, but of course, with the pandemic and ordering, remote ordering and things, now we're all uh, very familiar with QR codes. Our, our smartphones are able to read them more easily. Uh, and then that, that work was published in nanophotonics uh, and it drew a lot of interest from uh, the, in the public media as well as the technical media. And we were soon contacted by a group called the Document Security Alliance out of uh, DC. They're affiliated with the US Secret Service and uh, the Document Security Alliance was formed after 9-11 because of the recognition that the terrorists were able to use counterfeit IDs to get breeder documents that allowed them to gain access to the planes then that they subsequently used in, in the terrorist activities. And so the Document Security Alliance was formed to look at new forms of security printing and identity, identity protection. And so they contacted us and I say, it's kind of like getting called into the principal's office because they, they had seen what we had done with these covert images and they wanted to know more about them. Now, a, a decade later, uh, a lot of the state IDs are using these sort of uh, upconverting images. So that's, I, I, that makes us feel good that our technology is translated. But that was really our introduction into security printing as, as we call it uh, today. And so we then started uh, thinking about security printing in a bigger scale, uh, more from a center type activity, bringing in uh, other engineering disciplines, other science disciplines and other campuses. And that's where we, we had the partnership with the University of South Dakota. And I had good relations with uh, faculty in chemistry at South Dakota State University. And for me, it's always made sense to partner with our sister institutions in the state, simply because if you take all of the Board of Regents institutions and put them all together, collectively, we're about the size of Iowa State. And so for me, it's been about just finding the best talent in the state, regardless of campus affiliation. And I know that sometimes that kind of goes counter to your intuition, you know, stay at your home institution. But for me, I'm always looking uh, for the best and brightest in the state that I can partner with. And so that was the initial pairing was uh, the School of Mines, uh, University of South Dakota, South Dakota State. And then we competed in 2013 for what, what, what is called a collaboration grant. Uh, through the South Dakota Board of Regents. And we were uh, clearly collaborating very effectively at that point. And that was before the days of, of Zoom. Uh, we had a, a, a platform called the Access Grid that we would use for distance collaboration and sharing classes. And, and about that same time, the 2013 timeframe, uh, we competed for a National Science Foundation uh, grant called Research Experiences for Undergraduates uh, site that involved uh, the three campuses, which was very unique in the, the multiple campuses and is still very unique in that program. And it has continued to this day. It's been renewed every three years. And, uh, you know, I had some just incredible collaborators. I mentioned Dr. May on the upconverting nanoparticles, uh, Grant Crawford in materials metallurgy here uh, has been a, just a, a welcome uh, addition to the team uh, and, uh, and the faculty at Dr. Brian Logue at uh, South Dakota State University. And so you, you see here just some of our initial security printing applications. Uh, Dr. Logue at SDSU developed an ink based on tryptophan 
the chemical that kind of makes you sleepy when you eat turkey at Thanksgiving, but it, it, it is also uh, a material that can be UV activated. So we, we demonstrated printing a quick response code on a pill with the notion being that you could get information perhaps on the, the, the type of pill or the need to take it on certain days. Um, Jacob Peterson in our lab developed a, an optically variable ink. Here shown uh, through a glass life, you rotate it, it becomes silver and opaque. And that optically variable ink technology you'll see on US currency, um, a, a little different ink formulation that they use on paper than we, than we use on the glass slide. And then on the right here is a, a reader design uh, that John Hillard, a mechanical engineering graduate with David Langerman, uh, a computer engineering undergraduate, put together this design to allow us to read these upconverted, these covert images with a modified smartphone. And that led to one of the, the four patents that we have on that, that technology. Um, so as I said, that research experiences for undergraduate site supports 10 undergraduate researchers for 10 weeks in the summer. And so we're in the, in the midst of the REU site activity. We have uh, six students, undergraduates on our campus, two at SDSU, uh, two at USD. Uh, they, the students typically come from about half come from our campus. The National Science Foundation likes where about half the students uh, are outside of South Dakota in this case. And so that's always a, a really interesting uh, interaction when we get students from California and the, the East Coast coming in and they're, they're a lot of times shocked that South Dakota isn't as um, stereotypically backward as they might think. And actually, I, I think most of them find it very refreshing to come to uh, the Black Hills or Brookings or Vermilion in the summer. And uh, as, I, as I noted, the, that REU site now has been renewed twice. And so we're, we're in year nine of, of a renewal. That, that's pretty unique. Uh, those are very competitive programs. And so we're, we're quite pleased that uh, NSF has renew those and recognizes what we're doing. And here's just another example of some of the research that one of the undergraduate students was doing. In that case, she was formulating inks using these upconverting nanoparticles. And uh, as part of the system that we developed, we, we recognized that we needed to uh, stabilize the inks for long periods of time and to do it in a desktop printer. And so we bought a series of Epson desktop printers and we're loading cartridges with the notion being that the ink must be stable for long periods of time. And we developed a technology, water-based technology that would work with an Epson desktop printer, which is uh, no small feat. And so you can see just the, the printing in that time frame, 2016, 2017, and then the, the covert images that were printed. And the inks we developed were stable and non-clogging in those Epson desktop printers longer than the inks supplied for those printers by Epson. So we were quite pleased with our uh, technology there that we, uh, created and, and that that's led to four patents and uh, a, a commercialization of that original upconverting system that includes the the inks the reader and the formulation of the upconverting particles and because of that initial center funding we've been able to get additional supports for more uh, targeted research from the National Science Foundation. Uh, National Institute of Justice uh, ongoing project looking at latent fingerprints using uh, those upconverting technologies and, and the Department of Defense and a few private sector companies as well. One of our, our partners uh, throughout 
with the undergraduate research uh, piece of the center has been the Heritage Center at Red Cloud Indian School. Uh, if you've never visited the Heritage Center and you're in uh, the Rapid City area, I would encourage you to do so. It's on the campus of, of Red Cloud. It was started about 50 years ago where one of the Jesuit priests started collecting Lakota uh, uh, cultural assets because a lot of them had been dispersed uh, to the coasts or internationally. So he started trying to repatriate a lot of the Lakota uh, pieces. And we were fortunate because the Heritage Center will give us these pieces on loan and allow the students to do a kind of a combination of forensic analysis using analytical techniques in combination with uh, consultation with Lakota elders to help us understand the history of a lot of these pieces because they don't come with good provenance. And so one of the pieces we looked at was uh, this uh, pouch from a ceremonial bustle shown on the left here. And we obviously didn't want to untie it and look inside. And so we used computed microtomography to peer inside. And what we saw, this is a, a very short video uh, showing that there's some copper earrings and sage. And we were able to use x-ray fluorescence through the pouch to determine that the rings were copper. So that, that, that was a, a very nice piece to that particular project. And every year we, we go down to the Heritage Center and there's two of our students that go through and pick items that they do the forensic analysis just to give a better cultural heritage science perspective for the Heritage Center uh, to, to more, uh, to, that allows them to display these items with confidence. Now, we have uh, encountered uh, not necessarily counterfeit items, but items that might have come from a movie set rather than uh, traditional Lakota uh, holdings. So it's been it's been a, a great partnership with the Heritage Center. Oops. And one of the focus, um, what one of our focus has been on the production of what we call security end products, and I'm just showing a. a a few graphics here. Uh, this technology in the upper left was developed by Dr. Brian Logue at South Dakota State University. It's a rapid cyanide detection technology. So it's outside of the security printing realm. And you'll see more and more that we, we still have that core uh, expertise in security printing but uh, in recent years, we've expanded into what we call the, the illicit economy. And that is a, a technique that's been funded by the army to, to do rapid detection of cyanide for anti-terrorism applications. Uh, in the upper right here, this is the latent fingerprint technology I mentioned. Uh, on a, a lot of substrates, for example, a Coke can, um, a fingerprint is not very evident with traditional crime scene powders. Uh, the, in this case, the, the paint on the can fluoresces and uh, doesn't allow the image of the fingerprint, but these upconverting nanoparticles uh, optically avoid that fluorescence and allow you to detect a fingerprint on some of those hard substrates. And so that's been a National Institute of Justice project and that we've partnered with the South Dakota Forensic Lab in PEER. Uh, another example of security printing is this uh, on a printed circuit board, we are able to read, in this case, a quick response code that is printed underneath this opaque coding. And there's some, once again, there's some unique optical reasons that allow us to read uh, beneath an opaque coating like that. So we've, we've, we had a lot of focus on development of security and products. 
using, uh, in a lot of cases, student design teams, undergraduate design teams, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, computer engineers, uh, in partnership with materials people such as myself and chemists at, at University of South Dakota and South Dakota State. So that, that's kind of the, the history up until about 2017. And we, we started getting reviews from some of our proposals where the reviewers would mention that we needed uh, an emphasis on cybersecurity. And come to find out, it isn't traditional cybersecurity as much as an understanding of the markets that supply counterfeit goods or enable what, what we've come to call the illicit economy. And, and so we partnered then, began to partner with uh, Dr. Podorowski at Dakota State University. They've got a, a, a great capability in their cyber labs to uh, investigate the, the regular internet and the dark web and, and those markets that supply counterfeit goods. And uh, that, that partnership led to a graduate research traineeship proposal that we're in the midst of as well, uh, that will fund ultimately 34 graduate students now on those four campuses because we've added Dakota State University in, in addition to the original three. And we've broadened the research over the last two to three years into what we call the illicit economy. And that terminology is growing more and more common. And I, I just put up a slide here showing more uh, the, the trade of illicit pharmaceuticals and drugs, just trying to demonstrate that uh, with globalization has come uh, fragmented uh, networks that allow the distribution of illicit goods. And there, there are similar slides for human trafficking, counterfeit electronics, counterfeit, you name it. And it's, it has grown um, exponentially over the last 10 years, 15 years. So it's a, it's a, it's a big issue. And oh, the wrong way again, sorry about that. So, so that really is our transition into the illicit economy and why, sh why should we care about it? And broken up into industries, if you will, uh, these are the four uh, major components to the illicit economy, uh, illicit drug trafficking, uh, for example, fentanyl uh, has been in the news recently, and uh, just counterfeit crimes, that ties us to uh, the security printing, say, of counterfeiting uh, state IDs. Um, this is a image taken from a, a site where you can, for $90, have two counterfeit South Dakota IDs delivered to you. They are very high quality. And, and you might think, well, that's just some 18-year-old kid that wants to drink, but uh, it's more than that. And I go back to the 9-11 attacks and the use of counterfeit IDs to enable that. Another one that's been big in the news as of late is human trafficking. And finally, uh, what, what is called environmental crimes. And I'll go into some of those examples here. Uh, some of the, the, the big, what I call accelerants uh, of the illicit economy, uh, the internet, of course, the regular web, and then the, what, what is called the deep dark web where you can uh, be anonymous and Literally anything you want is for sale there. Uh, another driver is the digitization of manufacturing, right? A, a, a 3D printed part. If you get that digital file, you can you can counterfeit it anywhere. Uh, the, that notion of globalization of supply chains that I mentioned, and just globalization in general, 
online purchasing. We're all uh, kind of, I guess you could say almost addicted to online purchasing, particularly with the, the pandemic. Amazon, you're, you're very familiar with, but here are two uh, sites that were operating on the dark web, Alpha Bay and Silk Road, where, like I said, literally anything you could think of, uh, organs, guns, uh, pharmaceuticals are for sale. And another driver to the illicit, the growth of the illicit economy, direct courier shipments. Uh, the, the bad guys have figured out that the preferred shipment is the United States Postal Service, simply because the rules and regulations of USPS do not allow them to readily open a suspicious package. Where FedEx and UPS can do that, they're private. And so the common um, shipper is USPS. And let's say you, you want it dropped on a, a house that's for sale, you go to Zillow, you figure out where the house is, you have it shipped there. Of course, nobody's living there. You watch for the package to be delivered and they grab their package. So the bad guys are, are pretty clever, unfortunately, very entrepreneurial. Social media has really accelerated the, the ability of um, the different networks of um, illicit actors to have one hand off to another. And then of course, uh, anonymization, anonymization in the dark web and cryptocurrencies just also facilitate uh, the, uh, the whole uh, illicit economy. So tying this into South Dakota a little bit, and we always have to do that, we're getting funding for the Board of Regents. There, in the upper left is a fake pesticide lab. It, some estimates are that roughly 10% of pesticides that are used are uh, illicit. And that has long-term effects on our, uh, the viability, uh, the, the health of our food chain. Uh, one that's always in the news around August is the Sturgis bike rally there. It's more human trafficking. Um, and, and usually that's the South Dakota Depart Division of Criminal Investigation uh, in, involved with that uh, track, track and trace of humans during the rally. Uh, I mentioned, uh, fake IDs, this ID God. Now this is, this is in the open web. Uh, they, they're not trying to hide this at all. Uh, as I said, $90 gets you, I said two, but it looks like they're actually uh, sending three in this particular uh, advertisement. Very high quality uh, IDs when compared to the uh, authentic IDs. And uh, an example of environmental crimes, uh, I, I found this Dinosaur 13 on Hulu. Uh, it's very interesting, uh, the, the story of Sue the, the dinosaur and how uh, the bones were found on tribal trust lands and how it involved the state of South Dakota and some alumni in Hill City at the Institute of Geological uh, Research. Very interesting, but that's an exa example of environmental crimes uh, in South Dakota, the kind of the poaching of dinosaur bones. In terms of core laboratories, really there, there's one on each campus. On the lower left, we have the, what we call the direct right printing laboratory. Uh, and that's our, our digital print platforms that we we've used to be able to produce quick response codes or uh, whatever digital image with uh, security inks. The mass spectroscopy lab at SDSU focuses on the track and trace of counterfeit uh, pharmaceutics. Dakota State, as I mentioned in the cyber labs, their focus is on understanding the markets of the, the dark web as well as the regular web. And the University of South Dakota has a focus on the synthesis of nanoparticles for the, the security inks that we, we formulate. And that, that's kind of where, where we are today. Now, two weeks ago, we got notification that we had successfully 
uh, competed for what's called a governor's center. This is a higher level of uh, research funding that comes from the state of South Dakota that really uh, moves us fully from security printing into the illicit economy. And so that's, uh, I guess, you know, we, we, we ran a, a decade of focusing on security printing and now this is a five-year award that will focus more on uh, the illicit economy, still including the security printing uh, topics that I mentioned, mentioned earlier. And so that's a, that's a very quick run through on our center, our, I guess kind of now our old center and, and, and the new center that we're standing up in, um, in the illicit economy. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Keller. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A and we'll watch, watch for them. It's a very interesting presentation. Thank you. It, it affects a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, we and we teach a class on the illicit economy and it really, it, it still impacts me because a lot of the, you know, you think, well, I'm gonna buy a counterfeit uh, handbag. Uh, it doesn't impact anybody. Well, the, the terrorists in the Charlie Hebdo attack in Paris funded themselves through the sale of fake handbags and things. Um, so Larry Ayers asked, where is all this headed? Well, it, I'll tell you, it's headed to Oakoma next month. Uh, I'm gonna meet with the campus leads from the other campuses and we're gonna decide on which aspects of the illicit economy we think we can disrupt uh, most readily. And it, it'll probably come from one of those four industries. Uh, we've kind of put a pause on human trafficking simply because that is an area we do have some expertise in, but the state is very much interested in commercialization of technologies and that human trafficking just doesn't lend itself to that. So I think it's, it's headed towards a development of what we call those security end products. Uh, those uh, sort of technologies that we can develop systems around to help disrupt uh, the illicit economy. And, and we're going to do that, uh, that new center in partnership with a lot of the state agencies. Uh, for example, the Division of Criminal Investigation, that's, uh, and other law enforcement agencies will be kind of content providers for us to help us understand. And then, as I say, begin to disrupt the illicit economy. Hopefully that answers your question, Larry. If you have any other, yeah, if you have any other ones, please feel free to let us know. And then as, as we're waiting for, uh, if there's any other questions or an questions that we can answer, um, I'm gonna drop a survey link in the chat and your feedback is always appreciated. Um, this just gives us um, any suggestions or ideas for other topics that we, we would ha be happy to explore. And then um, just another other shameless plug. Um, reunion 2021 is fast approaching. I believe I counted 20, 20 days. I'm probably off there, um, but either way, it'll be here before we know it. So please pre-register. There's a ton of events that have been added to the calendar. Now um, there's a light breakfast. Uh, I would say it's light, but no, it's a normal breakfast. Um, the units and professional societies are adding their events in. So please register for that. Um, the full schedule can be seen um, here. So I'll add that link in for you guys to access and then you can also register if you haven't. Um, so it's gonna be pretty busy. So we're excited for that. Uh, it, Larry, I'd be happy to update you as we go along. Uh, and we'll really, I'll spend the, the rest of this summer standing up the new center. But I think the, 
the focus on the illicit economy resonates. Uh, it did with the, the state review panel and hopefully, you know, we not only commercialize, but we can do some, some good uh, along the way. So, yeah. And did, do, do they do, before we started, Dane said they used to do seminars on this. That's true. And, and usually in the summer, um, we have almost weekly seminar speakers that we, we oh, it's open to the, the public. Uh, and we'll, we actually started this week, but it was a seminar by me that, that I, I wasn't quite, it, quite ready to go public with that we presented to the students. But yeah, next Wednesday, uh, we have uh, an expert from Indiana talk, talking about the dark web that uh, I can definitely share the link. And like I say, it's, it's, it's open source information, but uh, I think uh, next week's presentation in particular, I heard versions from this presenter and it is very sobering about what happens on the dark web. Yes, very, in very interesting topic. Yeah. Makes you kind of wonder when you purchase stuff off Amazon, what you're, you know, what you're getting and not getting. So. And absolutely. And I, I say if something seems suspicious, it probably is. We, we had uh, students doing some uh, chemical processing and they added a, a, an air filter on a, a gas mask that were counterfeit and they got them off Amazon. Now, Amazon, I think, is trying to at least publicly say they are doing their best to nip that in the bud. But it, um, if something looks suspicious, be careful. Uh, it, it might be spelling or logos or something because, uh, yeah, there's a lot of counterfeits. And in that case, you know, the, the air filter on a gas mask, you could do a lot of damage to yourself, unfortunately. One of, one of the items I found really interesting is um, I'm part of some groups that do a lot of canning. And when the pandemic hit, uh, Ball, the Ball brand, um, there was a huge canning lid shortage. And so people would buy anything they could find on the internet that they thought was Ball. And they'd get them and the box looked totally different and the amount of just day after day, people posting on um, Facebook, the Facebook groups about how disappointed they were about the canning, the canning lids, because even the amount of money they've made probably just off those fake canning lids. So Ab absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> it's it, no, no product is immune. You know, the big one that the secret service cares about is our currency. And uh, it's out there, and the there's uh, foreign actors that have reproduced the U.S. hundred dollar bill, and they found it because the quality was too good, uh, simply because they they don't have the right plates and they're using digital printers. But the it's a it's a real problem. Mm. Mm. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, Larry, we'll, we'll do our best to keep you up. <laughs> yes. Um, and then next month uh, for our digital lunch and learn, Tom Durkin is going to present on the Mars 2020 Perseverance Rover. So sign up for that if you guys can. And then July 1st at 11. Um, Dr. Lori Anderson is giving an update from the geology and geological engineering department. So we look forward to hopefully having you all there. And if you have any questions that we didn't, that you think of afterwards, please feel free to email Dr. Keller. He'd be happy to answer them. Um, and he'll Absolutely. hopefully he'll be at reunion, but yes. <laughs> so you can find him then. Yes. <laughs> can they see, is the center open for Tourism. Yeah, the, the, the uh, direct right printing lab is on the rotation that Scott Roush has put together. So Larry, you can come see the lab too when you come. Yes. Yes, come see the lab. Okay. 
Well, thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you and have a good day. Yes, thank you so much.